uh, sometimes those uh, breaks in ministry uh, come for a reason. Sometimes, in my case, I let the spirit of stupid get on me and I disobeyed God. So anyway, he kind of set me on the side for a little bit to teach me some things. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Then I want to share some things God's laid on my heart with you. Father, we just come to you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for such mercy and such grace. Father, we just love you. We worship you. And Father, we thank you that you're a covenant-keeping God. And Father, I come to you right now in the words of the covenant that said if we were filled with the Holy Ghost, rivers of living water would flow forth from us. So Father, I call upon your precious mighty Holy Spirit right now to begin to think through my mind and speak through my lips as I surrender myself to him that this message that has been laid upon my heart that the Holy Spirit would rise up in me and glorify the Lord Jesus. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of the gospel. And Father, I thank you for that. And Father, I call out and cry out for the fire of the Holy Ghost. You promised the Holy Ghost in fire. And Father, I thank you for the fire that cleanses, the fire that heals, and the, the water of the Holy Ghost that brings refreshing and cleanses the mind and the heart. And Father, I give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to come down here just because I've always been more comfortable being down here. I probably do more one-on-one -on -one ministry than I do anything, and I love that. Um, going into hospitals, talking with people. God had uh, put me in that area as far as ministering to the sick when I right after I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And when you're ministering to the sick, um, you hear a lot of beliefs. When you go into hospital rooms and you're talking with people, people got a lot of beliefs that do not line up with this right here. And I believe with all my heart that's the reason they're sick. Is because what they're thinking, what they're believing does not line up with this right here. This message that the Lord gave me, all of you are familiar with it. But if you've ever been in that situation where you've read something that you've read a thousand times, and then all of a sudden, man, that thing just comes alive inside of you. Well, that's what happened. I was just reading in John, and all of a sudden, something just caught my attention. So I began to study, and as I did, God just began to burn some things in me. And I remember I was uh, visiting with Chuck just a minute, and I told him, I said, you know, the message the Lord gave me, I, you know, you feel like you're preaching to the choir. It's like, this is like basic 101. And uh, he reminded me, he said, don't forget the internet. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, so if you don't feel like this message is for you, just remember, it is for somebody, and I believe, I believe it'll help you. You know, Apostle Paul wrote, and Peter also wrote, that they, they bring things to your remembrance. Because I know how it is. Sometimes I get in the middle of a battle and I forget things I was taught. And somebody will read a scripture, bring something up to my remembrance, and all of a sudden it breathes that new fire in you and that new hope in you to bring things back. And you just want to say, Lord, forgive me. I let that slip. So what I, we're going to go over today, I know there's some of you in here right now that are in need of healing. And if you'll listen to this message, I am believing God that this message will help settle it once and for all, that God wants you healed, Amen. that he's not holding out on you, that there's something blocking the connection, but God is not holding out on you. So if you would, turn with me to John chapter 3. We'll start right there this morning. And I'm going to start out in verse 12. In John chapter 3, verse 12, 
the Lord here is speaking. He said, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now that's an interesting verse. We're studying now. Verse 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. These last two verses here is what I want to focus on this morning. He said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So let's go back over here to Numbers 21, and let's take a look at this story concerning the brass serpent lifted up. We're going to start out in verse 4. Numbers 21 in verse 4. And it says, as they, talking about the children of Israel that had come out of Egypt, as they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now let's stop right there for just a second. Let's think about this situation. These people are traveling through Egypt, I mean out of Egypt, and uh, they were supposed to go into the promised land. They disobeyed God. They didn't believe him. Now they're in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, at what time this is taking place, I, I'm not sure. But here they are, and they're beginning to complain about the provision that God has given them, the provision of food. Every morning, walking out, getting bread, and they first start out, and they say there is no bread, just murmuring and complaining. And as we see, that doesn't seem to please God very much. It's murmuring and complaining stuff. And so he sent fiery serpents. Okay, and when people begin to die from these snake bites, these poisonous snakes, and they begin to die, <clears throat> they came to their senses and decided, hey, maybe this is a good time to repent. <laughs> but you know, human beings are that way. Sometimes we wait <laughs> till everything in our life is falling apart, and then we think, you know, maybe I need to repent. Maybe there's something I need to repent of. So they repented, and they asked Moses to pray for them. They came to the man of God. They apologized to the man of God for talking bad about him, murmuring and complaining about him. And then Moses, being the meek leader that he was, immediately turned and began to intercede for the people and began to pray for the people. Now the people asked Moses to pray for something. They said, pray that the Lord God will take away these serpents. And Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, have you ever thought about this situation? Number one, they came and they cried out to Moses, priests, pray for us that God would remove these serpents. Now, why were the serpents there? The serpents were there as a judgment for their sin. 
because they had sinned. Murmuring is a sin. And because they had sinned, God sent judgment against them for that. And that judgment was the serpents. And they said, we want this removed, this judgment removed from us. We repent. We want this judgment removed. But I found it interesting that God didn't remove the serpents. He didn't remove the judgment for their sin. And he told Moses, you make a serpent and put it on a pole. And whoever looks at it will live. Now, when you're dealing with this, uh, the, the Holy Ghost was asking me different questions during this to get me to study. And it, it was interesting when you think about these people, the people that God is dealing with, which is much like people today. He's tried and tried to get them to believe him and to do things, and they've refused to step out on his word. And they asked him to remove this judgment, but he didn't. What he did was he gave them a way to have the power of that judgment broken off their life. Amen. Because, see, it is impossible to please God without faith. If God would have just removed the serpents, the people would have never had to believe God. That's just God removing them. But God said, no, I'm going to make a way so that no matter what comes into your life, there's a way to have it broken off of you. He wanted his people to learn to live by faith. Now you think about these people. You, you know, you got all these people here. I don't even know how many is there, but they've, they've said many of them have died. And now Moses, they go to Moses and they say, pray for us that God will remove it, move the serpents. Well, Moses goes into prayer. He comes out of prayer and he goes to work on building this snake. And then he hangs this thing on a pole, and then he goes out there and he sticks it right outside the camp. And everybody begins to gather around. And they're like, Moses, what did God say? Well, God's not removing the serpents. But God said that anybody that gets bitten, anybody that gets bitten, if you'll look upon this serpent on the pole, you'll live. Now, have you thought about that? Think about the different people that are around you and the different people that you deal with day to day. You know good and well there were some people that were excited. Praise God. God made a way where I don't have to die. Amen. God made a way. All I have to do is look at that serpent on the pole and I'll live. Amen. But then there was others. You know there was that would look at Moses and said, now Moses, we got people dying all around us from snake bites. And you're sitting here telling me that a snake on a stick is going to keep me from dying? <laughs> now, come on, Moses. There's got to be another way. Couldn't God just remove the serpents? Couldn't God just anoint your hands and have you come pray for me? I'm supposed to live if I just look at a serpent on a stick. I don't know how Moses would have responded to that. I think myself, I would have just said, God said it, that settles it. You can be healed if you behold this. Now, when you look at these scriptures and you look at this word, excuse me, this word looketh, it means in the Hebrew, it's a word that means to see, to appear, to approve, to behold, to consider, to discern, to gaze at, to take heed. You know, in that last verse, it said that those that beheld it lived. This word beheld is a different word, but it means to look at intently or to intently look at it's a word that means to regard with pleasure to regard with favor and to regard with care now don't forget Jesus is comparing himself to this in the gospel of John he said just as that serpent is lifted up I'll be lifted up 
Now, I've heard people say, you know, that the serpent represented their sin. But as I was looking at this and studying this, I'm thinking, you know, I don't think the serpent represents the sin. I think the serpent represents the judgment for their sin. Now turn with me to John chapter 12. Let's start in verse 27. In John 12, 27, Jesus is speaking and he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, the voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, there's a lot of different versions of the Bible out there, and I'm not going to say one's better than another. I've got 30 Bibles at the house. The thing I like about the old King James to me is the fact that when they translated the Bible, any word that they added themselves, they put in italics. You won't find that in other translations, but you'll find it in the old King James. And as I was reading that last scripture, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I noticed that the word men is in italics. And I thought, okay, it's not in the original text that's a word that was added by the translators so I thought what is he talking about if he's not talking about drawing men unto me now you can agree with me or disagree with me I'm not here to argue I just want to throw something out here at you Jesus is talking in the scripture right before this in his train of thought he said now is the judgment of this world I don't believe Jesus is saying he's going to draw all men to him, but he's drawing all the judgment for our sin unto him. He said, if I be lifted up, I draw it all unto me. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 28. I'll show you why I believe that's what he's talking about. In Deuteronomy 28, what you will find listed, and not all of them are listed here, okay? But you find in Deuteronomy 28 the blessings and the curse of the law, okay? And they're not all listed here, but a bunch of them are, okay? And you can read the blessings. What I'm going to focus on right now is the curses for the simple fact that to me another word for these curses is judgment the judgment for breaking the law the judgment for your sin let's start out in verse 15 and we're kind of we're going to kind of skip through here a little bit and read over some things but if you get an opportunity sit down and read Deuteronomy 28 all the way through because it'll bless you when you put it with with this message it'll bless you Verse 15, it says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall thou be in the city, cursed shall thou be in the field, Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. 
Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. Verse 20, the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings. Sounds like the Lord takes disobedience pretty serious, doesn't it? But as we're reading through this, think about something. If there's one of these is taking place in your life, one of these taking place in your physical body, in your mind, make note of it. Let's drop to verse 22. It said, The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until you perish. Now, I have no clue what some of that is, but it don't sound good. <laughs> mildew, blasting. I mean, you know, I've seen food mildew, but, you know, mildew, <laughs> I don't know. But notice it says, they shall pursue thee until you perish. When you study this stuff out, one of the things you'll begin to see and find that all this stuff is spiritual. All sickness and all disease is spiritual. And because of that, you can be set free from it. I know it affects the physical body, but it's a spiritual thing. And it'll affect your physical body. You remember Jesus ministered to a woman that was bent over and could in no wise lift up herself. And he said Satan had bound the woman. And he said she was bound by a spirit of infirmity. And besides that, you know that your spirit affects your physical body. James said, the body without the spirit is dead. It's your spirit that keeps you walking around in this body. But let's go on here. Look at verse 27 through 29 here. It says, the Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt. And with the emrods, and with the scab, and with the itch whereof thou cannot be healed, the Lord will smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. You have astonishment of heart? The itch, fever, blindness, madness. Look at verse 35. It says, The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore box that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Knee trouble, leg trouble, back trouble. It's all part of the curse. All part of the judgment. Verse 58 says, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear the glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuance." You've seen these sicknesses that just hang on to people. Diabetes, different sicknesses, MS, that are there for a long run, a long haul. They're part of the curse. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. See, I like that verse. That means it doesn't have to be listed right here. Any sickness, any disease, doesn't matter what it is. It's a curse. It's not a blessing. You'd be surprised the people that say it's a blessing. I tell them, no, it's not. 
It's not a blessing. It's a curse. It's a judgment for sin. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Let's look at verse, start in verse 3. This is a prophecy of Isaiah as God opened his eyes into the spirit for the coming Savior. And he reads here, when he's talking about Jesus, he says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Let's stop right there for a minute. You know, when I first began to read that, back when I first got saved, I wasn't sure exactly what he meant by that. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But you look those words up, they're words that grief means weakness, infirmity, distress, disease. The word sorrows means anguish, sorrow, affliction, pain. Doesn't matter what kind of pain it is, emotional pain, physical pain, doesn't matter. For surely he hath borne our griefs. Surely he hath borne our sickness, our weakness, our distress. Surely he has borne our anguish, our affliction, and our pain. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But no, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and our iniquities. The chastisement, the correction, the Amplified puts it this way, the correction needful for us to have peace and well-being was upon him. And by the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have every one turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the guilt and iniquity of us all. If I be lifted up, I draw all the judgment to me. You see, when I first began to minister to the sick and study the word, and I, I began to see this in Isaiah, I didn't understand. I'm like, Lord, you know, the scriptures say that through, through the cross, Jesus defeated the devil, that he bore sickness and disease. I said, then why is it still here? But see, he began to show me. Sin is still on this earth, and the judgment for sin is still here. Now, there's a greater judgment coming. But sickness, disease, poverty, lack, anguish, affliction, pain, suffering, that came through the fall. Through the fall and through sin came all this. But God didn't remove it. He didn't remove the judgment. But he did provide a way. And you see why Jesus began to proclaim, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Because through Jesus, he provided a way to have every curse broken off of you. You know, we read this here that he was wounded for our trade. He did it all for us. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. See, Jesus didn't sin. 
you know, all the sacrifices in the Old Testament were just a type and a shadow for Jesus. And when they would bring that lamb unto the high priest, he would examine that lamb and there could be no blemish. There could be no spot. There could be nothing wrong with this lamb. But yet that lamb was fixing to take the punishment for the sin of the person that brought it. The wages of sin is death. Just like in the Old Testament, when they began to sin and God sent the fiery serpents, the wages for that sin was death. But God said, there's a way. I'm going to show a way. I'm going to present a way to break that power off of you. To break the weight of that off of you. And he made it available. As we saw back there, it said any man. You think about that? Any man, it didn't matter. God said, this is all you have to do. Just behold. Just look. Just look intently at that. Just behold it and you'll live. Any man. But you know there were some, just like Naaman the leper, you know, when uh, Elijah sent a servant out there and told him, go wash in the Jordan seven times, you'll be cleansed from your leprosy. And he was mad. I didn't want it done that way. I wanted it done a different way. I wanted him to come out. I wanted the man of God himself to come out and the man of God himself to wave his hands over me. But his servant talked to him and said, it's not a hard thing. If he'd have gave you a hard thing, you'd have done it. He just made it easy. Let's go wash in the Jordan seven times. Yeah, but I don't want to be healed looking at a serpent on a pole. I want something else to happen. And they died. And I see it all the time, and it breaks my heart. When you talk to people and you minister to people, but they want it done a certain way and they have certain beliefs and they die. Jesus himself said, your religious traditions make my word of none effect. You thought about the power in this word? It says in Hebrews, this word holds this universe together. But Jesus said, your religious tradition can stop it. It's alive and it's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. God said, my word is life to those that find it. And health to all their flesh. God said, all you got to do is believe it. You know, I had a lady call me up on the phone one time when I was associate pastor of a church. She called me up and was having a lot of trouble in her hips, a lot of pain. Just had a lot of trouble. And and she called me up and I picked up the phone and she said, "Uh, you know, I I want you to pray for me. I said, okay. Okay. Not a problem. I, uh, she's like, well, I'm having a lot of trouble in my hips. I've had it for years and years. And uh, she said, I'd like to meet with you, you know, and pray for you. I said, that's fine. Just come on by. I'll pray for you. God will heal you. You can go on about your business. She's like, you make that sound easy. I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, are you saved? She said, oh, yes, I'm saved. Jesus is my Savior. I said, how hard did you have to sweat over that? I said, how hard did you work to get saved? She said, well, I didn't work at all to get saved. I said, the same blood that was shed, the same cross that made the way for you to get saved is the same cross and the same blood that will heal you. It ain't something you work for. It's something you receive. And so she came. And we sat down, and I began to share these scriptures right here with her. She had never heard them before. And I just laid them out there and shared it with her, never touched her, never laid hands on her. 
I just saw the light come on. And I know when the light comes on, the darkness leaves. I said, rise up, you're healed. She rose up totally pain-free. Not because of anything I did. <laughs> you can't give that credit to no man but one. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the things we believe will block the healing power of God. God doesn't hold out on you. I've heard every excuse there is. And, you know, there's some things that sound just really good, but they're just not Scripture. Oh, I'm just believing God's going to heal me someday. Well, that sounds good, but it's not Scripture. <laughs> By his stripes ye were healed. He's not holding out on you. He's not holding out on you. He made a way. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. Oops, somebody moved Corinthians in my Bible. <laughs> Let's look at these scriptures that you're all familiar with, but I want you to look at them now thinking about everything else we've gone over this morning. These are scriptures concerning communion, communion that we take every Sunday. You know, I was in a church in Big Lake, Texas as an interim pastor there. And at that time, they asked me if I was ordained, and I said no. And they're like, well, we would like to take communion, but if you're not ordained, you know, we don't think you should give it. And I said, that's fine, no problem. Well, I continued to teach there for about two more months, and then they come up and said, uh, we don't care if you're ordained or not, do communion, <laughs> would you? I said, not a problem. So I got in there, and I taught on communion, and... And the day I taught on it, I taught on covenant. And these people had been in this church for 50 years. And I got through, they come up and they said, you know, we didn't know we had a covenant with God. I'm like, you got a Bible sitting in your lap. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. It's like, but they'd never been taught. Nobody had ever taught them. But when I began to teach on covenant and began to teach on communion, we started seeing people get healed. People began to perk up and people began to get hope in their life that they didn't have before. Now, I want you to look at this here. We'll start in verse 23 and go through it. We'll skip a few verses here and there for the sake of time. But it says here in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also... I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Just like the serpent on the pole. When you look and study the word of God of everything that Jesus went through, he was spit upon, the beard was ripped from his face, he was punched, he was beaten, he was whipped till his back was nothing but shreds. And he said, every bit of it was for you. Why? Because that's what we deserved. See, he became a curse for us. That's what we deserved. But he said, look, And remember what my body went through and that it went through it for you. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Think about that for a second. Jesus is saying every time that you partake of this, you are showing or proclaiming his death till he comes. He's saying, I want you to focus on me on that cross. Just like they had to focus on the serpent on the pole. 
that every sickness and every disease is hanging on that cross. Every bit of anguish, every bit of affliction, every bit of pain is hanging on that cross. Just like the serpent. Every bit of the judgment for your sin and my sin, Jesus said it is hanging right there. And whosoever will believe will not perish. You'll live and not die. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning. The Lord's body. Same word as look and behold. Both those words also meant to discern, to look intently at. You look up this word discerning the Lord's body, he's talking about you in your mind realizing what he did. In his mind, realizing that he took it all upon himself, that everything, I don't care if it's weakness, it doesn't matter. He took it upon himself up there. God didn't remove it from this earth, but he made a way for you to get set free from it. Now, I'm a strong advocate for laying on of hands. But understand, you don't have to have hands laid on you. Those people out there, that were bitten by the fiery serpents, didn't have hands laid on them. They just beheld and looked intently at and believed, and they were set free. Now, you can't tell me God's holding out on you. You'll never convince me of that. I've dealt and dealt and dealt with people. Well, God's just putting me through this to teach me something. No, he's not. He has set you free. By the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Look at this. For this cause, what cause? Not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning what took place on that cross. You know, sometimes we get caught up, well, Jesus died for my sin. Yeah. But do you realize what that means? He took upon himself the punishment for your sin. And that's the reason, you know, back when, you know, I got saved 20, I don't know, 22, 23 years ago, got filled with the Holy Ghost a year or two after I got saved. And, you know, I I was guilty. I got caught up in it. You know, sometimes you'd be praying for somebody and and wasn't getting a result. The first thing you'd start doing is start asking them about their life and whether they had sin in their life and all. Well, the more I've studied this, and especially if you look at the book of James, you know, it, it talks about that the elders of the church will anoint them with oil. And the prayer of faith to heal the sick and the Lord to raise them up. And if they've committed sins, it'll be forgiven. So I finally got smart and quit asking. Who cares? He took it all. I mean, you can can walk in the hospital and I've done it. You go in there with sinners. They don't know Jesus, don't care anything about Jesus. Laying in bed in a coma. And take the word of God and get them out of it. Now, now I learned something from that. I I made a mistake or two because one of them needed physical healing. And he was in a coma and his liver was was gone. Been a drinking, alcoholic most of his life. And I thought, well, I'll just bring him right out of this coma and then deal with him. That was a mistake. I should have healed the body and then brought him out of the coma. Because when I brought him out of the coma, he didn't want to have nothing to do with Jesus. I'm like, so I thought, you know, you got to deal with that mind. Just let them sleep, get their body healed, then wake them up. But it's all available. It doesn't matter. People are always telling me, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. I said, it ain't about what you've done. It's about what he did. Amen. It ain't about what you've done. 
Sickness and disease has attacked your body. Why? Because it's here. You don't have to, I mean, don't get me wrong, none of us are perfect, and we always make mistakes. I made one or two myself this week. But the thing is, forgiveness is available. You know, I heard something on a, in a song on the radio today, never paid attention to, and it said something about, you think, you think forgiveness has to be earned. Now, what he was talking about at the time was, you know, sometimes you think somebody else has to earn your forgiveness. But you know, at the same time, what jumped in my heart was Jesus earned it. You don't have to earn forgiveness. You just need to receive it. If you have done something wrong, just receive forgiveness. You know, people all the time will tell me, you know, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. And I said, well, how many Christians have you killed? They said, do what? I said, how many Christians have you killed? How many Christians have you drug out and threw to the lions and threw them in jail and killed them? How many? Well, none. I said, well, the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament killed a bunch of them. <laughs> There's forgiveness. <laughs> There's forgiveness. And there's healing. Now look at this. It says, for this cause, and the fan has turned my Bible plumb out of, okay. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For this cause, not discerning the Lord's body, many are weak, many are sick, and many are dying prematurely. What's that tell you? Tell you there's an awesome promise right here. <laughs> that if you will discern the Lord's body, you won't be sick, you won't be weak, and you will not die prematurely. Amen. You know, somebody said something the other day, it just caught me. I'm like, you know, I never thought of it that way. You know, people always have this idea that if somebody dies, it's just the will of God. It was just their time. This right here says differently. You know, but he said, you know, Jesus went around raising the dead. If it was their time to die, what did he raise them up for? <laughs> I thought, duh. And he gave us instruction to go raise the dead. You know, one guy testified overseas. He said he was talking to some uh, village people. I don't remember what country it was now. I don't remember if it was Africa or where it was at. But anyway, the guy casually said something about raising the dead. And the guy says, uh, y'all raise the dead? And he's like, yeah, we raise them all the time. He said, oh, really? He said, what do you do? He said, well, we, we walk around. We find a dead person or somebody dies in the, in the village or whatever. He said, we just go up and ask God, are you through with them? And if God says yes, we bury him. <laughs> he said, if God says no, we rebuke death and we gather around them. And we begin to praise and worship God till they get up and worship God with them. <laughs> they just simply ask God, you through with them? No, well, let's raise them up. And they just don't quit worship until they rise up with them and begin to worship. But see, we, we over here have all this train of thought, this religious beliefs that keep miracles from happening. And it's not God's fault. God's not withholding. If he gave up his only begotten son, why would he withhold anything else from you? Why? He wouldn't. But for this cause, many are weak. Which means if I do discern the Lord's body, I won't be weak, I won't be sick, I will not die prematurely. I love the way David puts it in the Psalms 23. He talks about, he's talking about the Lord being his shepherd, but he goes on and he says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And you have prepared a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. 
right in the very presence of the enemy attacking your life, you can lay this communion out before you. And you can take communion, you can behold the Lord, and you can be healed, you can be delivered, you can be set free. I've taken this communion and laid it out before the Lord when, when there's been problems in situations. Had a good friend of mine de- die in an airplane crash and they couldn't find him. They didn't know where he was at. So me and my wife laid out communion. I sat down there and I said, Lord, enough of this is enough. I'm coming to you based on the covenant, based on the blood of your son. This man was a man of God. He was a pastor of a church. He helped save my marriage. Where is he? Find him. Show somebody. The next day a hiker found him. I've taken communion when my pastor had gone astray. And nobody else would let him in their churches. He ran off, got into drugs, did all that stuff, came back, repented, came back, wanted to be restored. Nobody would even let him in their churches. But I had a church at that time. I found out about it. I got furious. Me and my wife took communion. I don't know where he's at. I don't know if he's walking the streets. I don't know where he's staying. His sister didn't know where he's at, but God did. And I took communion. And me and my family said, Lord, you bring him to us, we'll restore. We'll restore him. That was on a Saturday, Sunday morning. I get up in the pulpit to preach, turn around, he's sitting on the back row. That's a covenant meal. It'll provide everything for you. You know, it says in, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul talking about the princes of this world. And he said, you know, if they would have known, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. So sometimes, you know, when your enemy's attacking you, you can set up this table and invite him. I invite him. Say, devil, come here for a minute. You're sitting here telling me I'm not going to be healed. You're sitting here telling me I'm not going to be restored. You're sitting here telling me that the bills are not going to get paid. You're sitting here telling me all this stuff. Well, come here, let me talk to you for a minute. And I sit him down as I sit down at the table that's been prepared for me in the very presence of my enemies. And I said, I know. I know if you'd only known, you'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. But when you crucified him, you set me free. set me totally free. I don't have to receive sickness and disease. I don't have to receive all that because there's a way. My God made a way. If you're in need of healing today, behold him. Understand, he's not holding nothing back from you. He made a way. And God's not picky. He gave all kinds of ways in here. You can be anointed with oil, You can be prayed for with hands laid on you, or you can just receive what Jesus has done for you. Either way, it doesn't matter. Just understand God wants you healed. You're his children. You're part of the very body of Christ. And Christ ain't looking for his body to be limping and sick and hurting. He's not withholding. Come, but come believing. If the pastors will come up, please, sir, or bishop, however you want to do it.